bling that could cost them millions. A tribunal has ruled that its drivers are entitled to holiday pay and the national minimum wage. There are too many workers being described as self-employed when they really should be entitled to the rights that all workers should get. This union-led case has exposed the dark side of Flexible Britain. Also tonight, two young children die in a house fire. Their father later found in a burning car. The FBI says it's reopening its investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails. Protecting Antarctica, the big conservation effort at the bottom of the world. And protecting the elephants, Harry's new role out in the wild. This is the ITV Evening News with Mark Austin and Charlene White. Good evening. Uber may have to pick up a multi-million pound bill after a landmark legal judgment saying its workers are entitled to the minimum wage and holiday pay. In a test case, an employment tribunal ruled the online cab company's drivers were employees, not self-employed contractors, and were therefore due to a range of benefits. Unions acting on behalf of Uber's 40,000 drivers across the UK said it could have far-reaching effects on other self-employed workers, many of whom are low-paid, as our consumer editor Chris Choi explains. Uber is a new way of hailing a ride, but old employers' obligations still apply, according to this groundbreaking decision. It says drivers like this, who've been regarded as self-employed, can be eligible for workers' rights. How could I be self-employed where I do not have control or anything? You know, and customer, customer sits with me, but do the customer pay me? No, no, no they don't pay me, they pay Uber. Uber has around 42,000 drivers operating in more than 20 UK cities. The company calls them partners rather than employees. But today's test case ruled that drivers are entitled to minimum wage, paid leave and regular breaks. My name's Christina and I drive with Uber because it gives me the time to spend with my son. Launched in 2009, Uber spearheaded a new type of highly flexible working. As it spread to other firms, union concerns have grown. Whether they're couriers or they're hotel workers, there are too many workers being described as self-employed when they really should be entitled to the rights that all workers should get to rest breaks, holiday pay and the national minimum wage. This union-led case has exposed the dark side of flexible Britain. No Uber spokesperson was available, but a driver paid by the firm to do interviews told me some prefer flexibility over rights. All idea of Uber from day one, it was to be um, flexible self for self-employed people who are doing a lot of things as myself um, in the meantime. Up till now, Uber has been in the fast lane of success. Tonight it says it will appeal this decision, but ramifications potentially go much further. For millions now categorised as self-employed are now anxious to know where this legal journey will end. Exactly. So, Chris, what happens now for Uber and companies like it? No doubt Uber will fight this. Of course, there's a lot at stake for them, but this goes much, much further. For thousands of workers, couriers, delivery drivers, other categories working in this sector, described at the moment as self-employed, firms beyond Uber like Deliveroo, Hermes, Addison Lee will now be under mounting scrutiny. It's interesting that some recent research suggests that up to 5 million people in the economy now could work in this kind of sector. Very hazy what their workers' status is. And the government has said it too is concerned about whether workers' rights and rules are keeping up with these practices as they rapidly develop through these technical innovations. They've now set up an independent review into modern working practices. All right, Chris, thank you very much indeed. A six-year-old girl and her eight-year-old brother have died in what police called a suspicious house fire in Birmingham. Neighbours helped drag them out of their home and laid them on a lawn, but they couldn't be saved. Police say the children's father was later found with serious injuries in a burned-out car. From the scene, Ben Chapman reports. Until last night, a family lived here. A children's trampoline remains in the back garden. 
Now the only occupants are police and fire investigators. A boy aged eight and his six-year-old sister died despite the best efforts of neighbours to save them. Lashman Samar's tenant next door told him what she saw. This woman crossed the road, it's a young girl, and she walked into the, uh, to the house to help them because it must be fire or hurt. And she picked up the, the child and brought to the lawn outside in the front. This morning, police launched a criminal investigation. Their suspect is the children's father. Firefighters were called to the house at around half past three. Four hours later and 40 miles away in Staffordshire, police found him with critical burns inside his fire-damaged car. Detectives say they're not looking for anyone else. We're still trying to establish what exactly took place and the mother of the children is helping the police to try and uh, give us that information. She's been supported by specially trained officers. Every new detail about what happened here last night has only added to the shock and sadness felt by those who knew these two children. Firefighters say they were confronted by a traumatic scene when they arrived here last night, but police say the fire itself in the hallway was small and that they do not yet know the cause of the children's deaths. Post-mortem examinations will take place tomorrow. The children's father remains in a critical condition in hospital. Ben, thank you. And police are investigating after a teenage boy was found dead in a burnt-out shed near Doncaster. His body was discovered when the emergency services put out a fire in the garden of a house in Campsall in uh, South Yorkshire last night. He's been named locally as 13-year-old Jack Sheldon. Rebel forces in Syria have launched a major counter-attack to try and break the bloody siege of Aleppo. Rockets were fired into the government's controlled west of the city, with reports suggesting up to 15 civilians were killed. There were also suicide attacks with trucks. Sejal Karia has the latest. The rebels are hailing this as the great battle of Aleppo. Unverified footage shows a suicide car bomb hitting a checkpoint in government-controlled targets in the west of the city. As further unconfirmed video appears to show rebels firing hundreds of missiles. The start of their big push aimed at breaking the Aleppo siege. The offensive began this morning with seemingly plenty of weapons at their disposal, along with a readiness to fight. This fighter said, we want to storm their positions. We are not frightened of their bullets or their ammunition. Before the order came to attack. And the suicide bomb trucks began moving to the front line. Much of Aleppo lies in ruins, having been subjected to a relentless aerial bombing campaign by the Assad regime and its Russian allies. They've encircled the east, trapping a quarter of a million people and pounding the area with daily airstrikes. At least 500 people have been killed in the last month alone. But breaking this siege won't be easy. They're fighting against a Syrian army supported by the Lebanese, Iranian, as well as other militia, and bolstered by Russian firepower. And with the rebels entangled with extremist groups, they're unlikely to get much help from the West. Sejal Karia, ITV News. And a bit later on on the ITV Evening News, we'll be hearing from the British doctor who risks his life in the Syrian war zones. Now, in the past half hour, it's uh, emerged the FBI is reopening its investigation into the Hillary Clinton email scandal. It follows the discovery of new emails said to be pertinent to the case. In July, the FBI concluded that although Clinton had been careless for using a personal server, she should not face charges. Let's go to our Washington correspondent, Robert Moore. And, Robert, all very interesting, the election beckons. How significant could this be? Well, some background first, Mark, because it's a slightly complicated story. But the key question has always been that why did Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, have a private email server based not at the State Department but in the basement 
of her, of her own private home. Uh, obviously much less secure than the servers run by the uh, US uh, State Department. So the fundamental question underneath it all was, had she somehow compromised American national security? A pretty big question if you're aiming to be president and commander in chief. Now, over the summer, the FBI investigated it and described her conduct as extremely careless, but said it did not reach the threshold of criminal conduct. But now in the last few minutes with this letter uh, from the FBI to Congress, they've announced that they have reopened this investigation. The implication being that they have, may have discovered some fresh incriminating information about Hillary Clinton's email use. Um, so that's significant. Of course, we're only 11 days away uh, from the election. This gives tremendous amount of ammunition to Donald Trump. Uh, his campaign adviser in the last few moments has said about the new probe, uh, this is superb. This is extraordinary news for the American people. And one other point, of course, Mark, this is uh, believed by the US intelligence community to be an email that has been hacked by the Russian government and then distributed by WikiLeaks, raising the even more disturbing question of whether this election narrative is being actually controlled by the Kremlin. Right. Well, we'll see where this goes. Robert, thank you very much indeed. Still to come tonight. Remarkable pictures of Prince Harry helping to move herds of African elephants to a safer home. In some countries, the numbers are, you know, dropping unbelievably quickly. In other countries, you've got you know, almost too many. That story and more in just a few moments. Welcome back. The world's biggest marine reserve has been created in Antarctica, with campaigners calling it a milestone for conservation. The Ross Sea, which is six times bigger than the UK, is one of the last intact marine ecosystems in the world. Commercial fishing will be banned for 35 years to safeguard species like penguins and tiny krill, which are eaten by whales. Our science correspondent Alex Jar on protecting what's been called the world's last ocean. The Ross Sea in East Antarctica. Even for such a remote continent, this place is hard to reach. But despite that distance, it hasn't escaped human influence. So today, it was declared the world's largest marine park, protected from commercial fishing. Some have been going to extreme lengths to raise awareness of the problems facing this area and to campaign for today's momentous decision. It's an amazing area. I mean, it, it, it really is. When you arrive in the Ross Sea, it's a, it's a sight to behold. It's, it's like a polar garden of Eden. You'll see enormous great icebergs, you'll see sea ice, you'll see small little Adelie penguins, you'll see great big emperor penguins, uh, leopard seals, uh, weddell seals, you'll see uh, enormous great humpback whales and minke whales. It looks like what I expect the whole world used to look like before man put his hand on it. This is the first marine park created in international waters. And as such, the negotiations between 24 countries and the EU took five excruciating years. China and Russia both have fishing industries here. Protecting this sea will have impacts for all of us. It's about safeguarding our future food resources like krill, um, but also a vast biodiversity that does incredible ecosystem services hidden from us, taking carbon dioxide from the air into algal blooms that's eaten by animals that's buried on the seabed. Uh, and they are doing that in hundreds of thousands of tonnes every year of CO2 that we make, and they're doing it for free. The new protections for the Ross Sea will remain in place only for the next 35 years. After that, the world will have to decide again whether or not it values its most pristine landscapes. Alok Jha, ITV News. Here, the supermarket chain Morrison's has put up the cost of a jar of Marmite by 12.5%. It's the first supermarket to raise the price since a recent public spat between Tesco and Unilever when the uh, manufacturer wanted higher prices, blaming it on the effect of the falling pound. The National Audit Office says the NHS in England is failing to collect millions of pounds from so-called health tourists. The target by 2018 is to recover £500 million a year from visitors who are not entitled to free treatment, but that's about £200 million less than recovered this year. 
and Downing Street's insisted there will be no second referendum over Brexit. It follows a suggestion from uh, former Prime Minister Tony Blair, who said voters should be given the chance to change their minds once the details of the deal were known. Now, earlier we reported on the continuing battle for the Syrian city of Aleppo, where every day doctors risk their lives to save others. Many of them are being trained by a British team led by surgeon David Knott, who's worked in many war zones around the world. At a camp north of the border in Turkey, they practice life-saving techniques, knowing that soon they'll have to return to face more casualties and more violence. Our Middle East correspondent Geraint Vincent saw their sometimes graphic training in Gaziantep. With forceps, you won't be able to grab it. How to perform emergency surgery in one of the world's most dangerous places. Always keep These doctors work in hospitals across Syria. They're qualified in many different fields of medicine. But here in southern Turkey, they're using sheep's entrails to practice dealing with trauma caused by bullet wounds and bomb blasts. I think they're amazing. I mean, I, I take my hat off to them all, really. They are tired, they're worn out, uh, they're exhausted, but they'll still come over the border, they'll still come here. Gives them a bit of respite for two or three days as well, uh, realising they're not being attacked, they're not under uh, gunfire. David himself has spent much of his working life on the front line in war zones the world over, most recently in Aleppo, three years ago. From heart major vessels, now he leads a team of UK-based surgeons passing on vital skills to their Syrian counterparts. Of course I'd like to go back to Aleppo, of course I'd like to be with them, of course I'd like to be operating and showing them how to do things, um, but I can't. And I can't get into Syria, nobody can get into Syria, um, so this is the very best option we can do. At the end of the three-day course, the doctors will make their way back into Syria, where hospitals and emergency response teams are routinely targeted in the bombing. In Aleppo a few months ago, a paediatrician, Mohammed Wasim Maaz, was killed in an airstrike on his hospital. His brother Bakri is now one of Dr. Knott's students. <laughs> And there's no shortage of lives to save in Syria where the conflict has reached unprecedented levels of brutality. I've never heard of bunker bombs, I've never heard of cluster bombs being attacked. I've been to 20 odd wars in my life. I've been attacked by aerial bombardment, which are just bombs and fragments and things like that. I've never actually been involved in, in a, a war whereby the worst munitions possible could have been used. And that's what's happening now? And that's happening now, all the time. And sometimes you can do it like this. There aren't many doctors still working in those parts of Syria which are under siege. What medical care that does make it through is down to the courage and compassion of a handful of professionals. Geraint Vincent, ITV News, Southern Turkey. A new contraceptive injection for men is almost as effective as the female pill. That's what a new trial has shown. It works by suppressing the production of sperm and switching off the male reproductive system. But there are concerns over the jab's side effects, not to mention uh, where it's administered. Richard Palo spoke to one couple who say it could change lives for good. Yeah, that's nice, isn't it? Yeah, that's good. Searching for a house together this afternoon, Katie and Lorne. Katie is one of three and a half million women in the UK currently taking the contraceptive pill. Up until now, this has solely been a female responsibility. Now there's a possibility men may be able to do it too. It's had various impacts on things like mood, in terms of anxiety. Um, I used to suffer really badly with migraines from it also. I think it would be good to be able to potentially share that kind of burden with a partner if you're in a long-term relationship, definitely. And Lorne, for you, what would it mean to take on the responsibility and also perhaps the side effects that come with that? Yeah, I really don't see it as a problem. I don't think it should be. You know, I think it's quite an archaic way to think that it should just be for the, the woman in the relationship. Relationships about teamwork, so it's about doing what you need to do. 
The hormone-based injection targets the brain's pituitary gland to reduce sperm count. Over the year-long trial, it was 96% effective in preventing pregnancy. Three quarters of the men said they would use the method as a form of contraceptive in the future. Yet there were noticeable side effects, including muscle pain, depression, and in some cases, an increased libido. We've got to make sure it's acceptable and of course it is an injection and it's every two months and so would men go along and get that injection every two months and are there any serious um, side effects that we would need to know about. All previous attempts at producing this method of male contraception have failed to become a commercial reality. For couples everywhere it may be some time before that changes. Richard Palo, ITV News, Banbury, Oxfordshire. And finally, a question. How do you move hundreds of elephants to a new home? Well, if Prince Harry's recent experience in Africa is anything to go by, it requires a mixture of brute strength and plenty of affection. Over the summer, Harry helped relocate the endangered animals to a na nature reserve in Malawi. It's part of his crusade to save them from poachers, as Martha Fairley reports. Prince Harry has a close affinity with Africa and its wildlife. Last year, he saw firsthand the devastating effects of poaching on South Africa's rhino population. This new film shows his return to the continent in the summer on one of the largest ever projects to move 500 elephants to a reserve in central Malawi. Where are we going to put all these animals? You know, in, in some countries, the numbers are you know, dropping unbelievably quickly. In other countries, you've got you know, almost too many. So there's this weird imbalance. So organisations like this need to constantly come up with new methods to move these animals, to care for them, to make sure that these places are looked after. And this is a challenge, it's a huge task. It's amazing to see such unbelievable creatures being moved in a way that you could never even dream of. They need to be moved to another place. So this is the most efficient and least invasive yeah. way of being able to do it. I can tell you after three weeks there's zero stress on these animals and they're going from one beautiful place to another beautiful place. And Harry hopes by moving this herd to a place where they can coexist with local human populations, their long-term survival can be secured. Martha Fairley, ITV News. Well, that's all from us for now. Alice Stewart will be here later with news at 10. But from all the evening news team, have a very good night and a good weekend. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.